We begin the service in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our invocation continues with one verse of hymn 253. Scripture text that I've chosen for today is found in the first chapter of the book of Acts. Uh, The context for this is that uh, the resurrection, of course, has taken place. They have seen uh, the Lord leave them. Uh, They've had the marvelous promise that's found in Acts 8, uh, but you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And uh, then this particular incident takes place. In those days, Peter stood up among the brethren. The company of persons was in all about 120. And he said, Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who was guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in the ministry. And then the author, Luke, has a parenthesis with a little bit about Judas. Now this man, he says, bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their language a keldaba, that is, field of blood. Then Peter's speech continues, For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation become desolate, and let there be none live in it, and his office let another take. So one of the men who had accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two. Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Lord, who knowest the hearts of all men, show which one of these two thou hast chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was enrolled with the eleven apostles. Let's sing hymn 177, verse 1 and 13.
Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. For nearly a thousand years now, since about the year 1000, the Christian community has directed its attention in this season to the figure of St. Matthias. Now, last week in February, you have uh, the feast of St. Matthias. Now, with most of the apostolic figures that are recognized in the Protestant liturgical calendar, it is possible to gather enough material so that some sort of exegetical or historical uh, conclusions may be drawn. We know quite a bit, for example, about Peter and Matthew, about Paul and Thomas. Matthias is in a very different category, however. In fact, if I had not just read the passage that speaks of his calling, I don't think that even half of you would have been aware of his identity. And uh, that half would probably be a much higher percentage than one would find in an ordinary congregation. And this is not surprising, since this text is the only reference to him in the whole of the New Testament. In spite of his position, as one of the twelve, he is really one of the unknown persons of the early church. In spite of this, or perhaps because of it, he can be a rather significant figure for our community at this particular time of the year. Uh, I know he's been helpful to me. In February and March, many people are sick of the school routine, and in spare moments we like to daydream about other places and greener pastures. Freshmen, sophomores, and juniors are starting to plan for their summer work, centering always on the future, trying to collect enough money to continue college and to get ahead. And the seniors, well, they're really living in another world. I can tell this every year. Been here long enough. After four years, almost four years of people wandering around in overalls and sweats, suddenly three-piece suits are beginning to appear as people prepare for job interviews, or they're studying carefully in the Center for Student Development and filling placement forms. Some have jobs already or have applied to graduate school. A, a whole new age is opening up before them, and the ties to the present, like tests and papers, are becoming even more irksome than usual. As we look away from the classroom, this is a time of aspiration, hope, and enthusiasm. It is also a time for many of secret and open promises that vow to change the system, to make a lasting mark, perhaps to set some corner of the world on fire for Christ, if your vocation is specifically Christian. And there are promises to climb the ladder until we too pocket a share of the American dream. It is a time of dreams and plans for a meaningful service which makes a recognized and approved contribution. This enthusiasm and these vows, of course, have a, a double aspect for both of us, all of us. Since Christians, whether they're students, teachers, administrators, doctors, school teachers, whatever, since Christians are, of course, human, they are in Christ both justified and sinners at the same moment. Our motives have a certain ambiguity. There is the overriding concern for serving the world, for making a mark, for improving things, for constructive change. Yes, and whether one's occupation is secular or clerical, there is a concern for bringing persons to Christ. But there is also always a note of self-concern, which is directed not by the gospel, but by the egoism, which is our constant companion. In this connection, we note also that this is a time when, in daydreams at least, careers are mapped out. An hour when one's rising star is clearly visible. A senior, for example, bored by a lecture that no longer seems pertinent, may think, well, I'll be satisfied to begin in a small business or school district or maybe as a lab technician at 3M or someplace. No one starts at the top. I'll sharpen my tools there, but in a few short years there will be a call to a larger business or school district or college or business. And when my administrative and other skills are recognized, there'll be other moves and someday I'll join the exclusive ranks of the leaders who play musical chairs 
whenever a great move or advancement is possible. Or perhaps one of your strengths is administration. You like political maneuvering, and you have visions of being a political leader. Another Martin Sable. Martin is a good politician, and there are many good politicians, and he's an Augsburg project. And you can see it now, how to do that. You can be active at precinct caucuses, or maybe, as some of our students, you can participate in or be chairs of uh, uh, the cam statewide campaign of uh, presidential nominees. You get to be a delegate someplace. You do your homework. Don't offend too many people. Build a particular area of expertise. Cultivate your friends. And maybe someday you'll be state representative. You run for office, and you have, a, have an office in downtown St. Paul or maybe even a place like Washington. Or perhaps teaching is your vocation. You're, you're going to do this. You dream of stupendous success in graduate schools, books and papers published, an eventual appointment as, for example, a school superintendent, like another Augsburg alum, Richard Green, superintendent here and then in New York, or an appointment as a professor at some prestigious school uh, where you will continue to make a mark. People of the world, and that's all of us really, since we are not divorced from the world, do dream about power and money. But even persons called to serve the Lord Christ specifically dream about preferment and success. I suppose some of this is inevitable, all things considered. These rising star fantasies are all right in daydreams unless they divorce one completely from reality. I can remember eighth grade math. That's a long time ago except for the moments when Miss Brown was standing right in front of me, I spent all of my time just about in eighth grade math thinking, daydreaming about being a fighter pilot. This was during at the start of the war, and I was going to, I could picture myself taking off in a P-38, some of you young people don't even know what that is, a P-38 off Commonwealth Avenue in Madison, Wisconsin, flying up to defend Oscar Myers and the state capitol <laughs> from the Germans or the Japanese or anybody. Little problem there with daydreams because the next year I had as a math teacher a track coach for the senior high school. This is a big school and I was already uh, broad jumping farther than some of the other people. He used to bring me magazines and I would read that during math class. And I almost went under the next year. I had Elsie Conlon who was the head of the math department. And it was a close, as closest to a disaster that I've ever experienced. Daydreams can incapacitate one, but they're all right, and they set some tone occasionally. The problem is when we make the type of success that we see in our daydreams a test of our value. When we come to feel that without this upward spiral that we are failures in society and specifically in the work of our Lord, then there can be only frustrations and ill will when this success does not come and there will be doubts about one's abilities and vocations itself if we allow this to be the measure of what we are. And it is precisely at this point that Matthias is most helpful to me. We know next to nothing about this person. His name means gift of Jehovah, so we might conclude that his parents were at least pious people. Although he was with our Lord throughout his ministry, just how he entered the fellowship is not known. There's no record of his call. Peter and Andrew and James and John were chosen for the inner circle, but Matthias was apparently just one of the company of 70 who followed along. And he became a member of the Twelve in a rather inauspicious fashion also. They drew lots to decide who was going to be in the position. In modern parlance, they tossed a coin to decide between Barsabbas and Matthias. Even the text we read, the only place where he's mentioned, spends more time on Peter and Judas than on Matthias. And I hope you noticed in verse 12 of this one, this hymn for lesser festivals is supposed to be for the day of St. Matthias. They talk about how bad Judas is and how glad they're not, he's not around anymore. Very little 
if anything, about Matthias. We compare this to the more illustrious members of the team. Peter and Matthew called away from their work by the Lord himself, or St. Paul struck down dramatically on the road to Damascus. We don't know much. We don't know much about his activity in the Lord's service. We know about many of the others, and not just the twelve. We know about Philip the deacon and his efforts, Timothy and the others, but not a word about Matthias. The area in which he worked is unknown. Did he move out, as Peter did, to work in the diaspora of the Jews? Did he go to Samaria, as Philip had, or to the Gentiles, as Paul did? Did he stay and minister to the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem and then cross the, cross the Jordan to Pella in 68 or 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed? Not a word. No one knows. Even the legends surrounding the man are obscure and incomplete. The cloudy and contradictory stories are sharply in contrast to the details for the major figures. Some say he ministered in Ethiopia and died there. Others say that he was crucified or beheaded or stoned in Jerusalem, Rome, or someplace else. Someone played on his obscurity by attaching an apocryphal gospel to his name in the second or third century, but this is most certainly not his. There is, in short, no information at all about him. He was simply swallowed up in the service of the church and its Lord. Now, if we wish to apply the tests supplied by our daydreams to Matthias, then he must be reckoned as a colossal failure. And in the years ahead, most of us will share in his type of failure. For we will be closer in fame to him than to either Peter and Paul. All of this is to say that while we must keep our enthusiasms, our drives, our ambitions, our willingness to work, to make a mark, we have to alter our concept of success. One of the many surprises in the message of Jesus is his constant insistence on the worth of what other people would call obscure service. He once spoke of the crucial importance of just a cup of water given in love. He insisted that to feed the hungry and visit the prisoner were deeds of cosmic and eternal meaning. He gave warning repeatedly that it is often not within human wisdom to know when service is great or small. A widow woman, woman casting her two copper coins into the treasury or the unknown Simeon carrying the cross for Jesus have glorified the human race immeasurably more than the wisdom of a Gamaliel or the pride and the power of a Caesar Augustus. And we should remember the parable of the master who left his stewards in charge of his goods and then returned for an accounting. There will be an accounting, and there are varying gifts entrusted to each of us. us. We must be aware of their value and how we can use them. There are many people in the world more talented than we are in many ways. There are better plumbers and cooks and exegetes, better carpenters and teachers, better singers and certainly better preachers. But we remember that in that story, every servant of the master was given something. No one was left completely empty. And the point is we are to be faithful over what we have. Most of us will spend our days in small niches in the great church and society. We will be important but small cogs in a huge wheel, small fish, if you will, in the ocean of God's concern and activity. Matthew's and Paul's are necessary, and God will provide them. Maybe some of them are here. Christian business leaders and great politicians, musicians, doctors, teachers are needed. But most of us will simply share with Matthias in the service a obscurity of simple service. We will share with him, as B Peter put it marvelously, in being witnesses to the resurrection. Perhaps some of you will one day be great and applauded and recognized persons, but you can never be more successful than Matthias, who simply walked with Christ and was his witness. Let us pray. O Lord, you who judge success not by honors or station, but by the heart, grant that this standard may also be ours.
so that we may by your grace be pleased to follow you simply even as your servant Matthias and the saints unknown to us but all numbered by you even as these have followed you through all the ages. Amen. We'll have a little prayer here also and then not have the last hymn. I've been reminded of some persons who have special needs. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for all the good things of life. and We thank you for the promise that you would be with all those who are in special need. We raise before you our concerns for Maria Brown, whose husband is seriously ill, for Vincent Peter, who is having tests, medical tests this day, for Maria Anoni on the death of her mother, for Vincent Duncan on the serious illness of his father, for William Green uh, on the illness of his wife, and for John Mitchell. We present all these names and those whom we raise in our hearts before you, confident of your promise of strength and wisdom and direction. Amen. Benediction, two minutes over, as usual. May the Lord Almighty dispose our days and our deeds in his peace. Go in peace, serve the Lord.
Blessed Lord, you speak to us through the Holy Scriptures. Grant that we may hear, read, respect, learn, and make them our own in such a way that the enduring benefit and comfort of the word will help us grasp and hold the blessed hope of everlasting life given us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Scripture is from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. This is the end of the reading. Good morning. When it comes to Christianity, I believe that each and every one of us is on a journey. Some of us, just as a roadmap, may be taking alternative routes. Some of us may be taking the straight route, and some of us, some of us may be going the wrong way altogether. It's a journey that takes us through life and all that comes with life as we know it. Happiness, sadness, joy, laughter, pain and suffering, all kinds of emotions. And sometimes during our Christian journey, we might even experience the emotion of being ashamed or embarrassed about who 
who we are as Christians. There have been some really embarrassing moments in my life, like the time when I was in kindergarten, I'd like to share with you. Let me explain. We have five kids in our family. I'm the youngest out of the uh, five. I have three older brothers and an older sister. My parents both worked full time, and it was the responsibility of my oldest brother, John, to make sure that I was ready for school each morning. Before my mom left for work each morning, she would lay out my clothes and usually pick out the worst ones. Um, and she'd take a bottle of VO5, you know, the stuff in the green bottle, your dad probably still uses it. And she would put a little bit in her hand and she would run her hands into the faucet and wet it. And she would put it in my hair. And this was kind of a ritual thing that she did. She'd comb it in the worst style she could think of. <laughs> well, one day my mom had to leave early, earlier than normal for work. And uh, she asked my brother John to take care of me and to see that I got ready and was uh, put on the bus on time. Well, rather than have my brother take care of me, I told him I was old enough and uh, to take care of myself and that, uh, that he could go ahead and leave. Besides, what could be so hard about putting a little VO5 in your hair? A lot of help it did me now, anyway. <laughs> to make a long story short, I put so much VO5 in my hair that day, when I combed through it, gobs and gobs came out on the comb. Just then, the school bus was coming down the hill, and I didn't know what else to do, so I put on a baseball cap and I and uh, ran to the bus and made the bus on time. I wasn't sure what I was going to do once I got to school. To, to actually go into class and to be embarrassed by my classmates, I thought never. So when we arrived, everyone took off their boots, as was customary back in kindergarten, and they... They would take, off your, we'd take off our boots and put them in the hallway with the front of the boot facing outwards and everything was in a neat row. And then we all got to put our jackets inside of a walk-in coat closet. I never came out of that closet that day. <laughs> I don't know how I uh, never got caught, but I, that's a true story. When I was in elementary school, I was teased by classmates for having a, a chipped tooth. I had a silver cap on it. Um, one day I got so fed up with being teased, I pulled the cap off during class. And uh, that evening I went to the dentist and he told me I didn't have to wear it if it didn't bother me, so I didn't. But I did go around uh, the rest of my elementary days known as Bucky for having a chipped tooth. So another embarrassing moment. I made it through junior high like most kids. The only real, real thing that seemed to embarrass me then was when my parents came around to pick me up and the other kids were standing around and you'd have to say, yeah, it's my mom. All of these memories have played a part in my overall development. I look back at them now and I laugh and they seem quite trivial. There is, however, one embarrassing moment in high school that I would like to share with you. It has made a real impact on me and my Christian journey. I attended Wyzetta High School where I was considered to be a fairly popular person, well-liked and never causing trouble. I was an average student at best, but most teachers probably were thankful for that, especially ha after having my brother Dave. They were probably thankful that my parents weren't Catholic either and that five was enough. Athletics played a major role for me during my high school time. I participated in football and I raced on our cross-country ski team. During the, the spring, I lifted weights and prepared myself for the following football season. I was elected by my teammates as one of, the, one of three football captains for my senior year. About mid-season, all of the captains from the Lake North and Lake South, now known as the Lake Red and the Lake Blue uh, Conference, were invited to a luncheon to be held at the Wyzetta Country Club. The keynote speaker was former Viking and, I believe, linebacker Wally Hilgenberg. Um, this was quite the honor uh, for a high school kid to, to get a chance to meet you know, a former player and to actually get a chance to talk to him and possibly even get an autograph. Um, I wasn't really sure what this meeting was, was for, except for a chance for the other captains to meet each other and to get a free lunch. The two other captains were Tommy Summers, who played quarterback, and Dan Dugan, our middle linebacker. Dan was probably the most gregarious guy in school. He was Mr. Popularity, homecoming king, uh, the senior class president, and also very popular with the girls. Wally went on to talk of his professional football career and his accomplishments, and he also told some of the more humorous stories that had happened to him during his professional football career. Um, he went on to say that during his last game at the old Metropolitan Stadium, now where the Mega Mall stands, 
Um, he hit his lowest point of his life. All this time he had been fooling himself. He told of how his marriage had dissolved and how drinking nearly killed him. And now after his last home game, how he had gone out into the middle of the field on the 50-yard line and stared out into the empty bleachers. There were no more crowds cheering for him and there were no more fans uh, looking up to him. He was alone. It was at this time he knew he had to get help. It was at this time that he turned to the Lord. He went on to explain how Jesus was with him and could be with us as young uh, high school students. Um, I was going to confirmation at the time and I had been going to church fairly regularly with my folks and so I never really questioned if I was a Christian or not. I thought I was anyway. I went to church, confirmation, what else is there? Wally ended his story with a prayer and during that prayer, he asked that we all bow our heads and close our eyes. He gave thanks and then asked for all those who would like to take Christ into their lives, please raise your hands. Well, I assume that everyone would have their hands raised. I mean, everyone's a Christian. I mean, why not? So I raised my hand. There was complete silence amongst the 300 or so athletes, coaches, and guests. Everybody, Everyone had their eyes closed and the thing I dreaded to hear most was, I see that hand, that hand. This feeling of being singled out, of explaining or almost, I immediately opened my eyes to see if it was true and so did Tommy Summers and Dan Dugan. I was the only one. This feeling of being singled out, of explaining or almost apologizing to teammates and other classmates why I raised my hand during the afternoon luncheon has really affected me on my journey uh, with Christianity. I entered Augsburg back in 1981 as a freshman with a fresh start, no preconceived ideas about who I was from classmates, teachers, counselors, and coaches. My journey continued. I met an individual that year who was to become like a brother to me. His name is Chuck Rath. Chuck and I met during fall football practice. We were both sitting against opposite walls in the upstairs lobby areas of Cy Melby Hall with all the other freshmen waiting to get our equipment. I saw Chuck sitting by himself, and for some reason I got up and went over and introduced myself. Chuck came from a dysfunctional family. He was the first of nine kids to attend college. He took on the responsibility of raising his younger brothers and sisters and kept his family together. Chuck was the type of person who was very comfortable with his Christianity. He was able to talk very openly about it to me and to others, sometimes putting people off. Through the years, Chuck and I became best of friends. I learned through Chuck what giving of yourself to others less fortunate was all about. I learned that I had it pretty darn good and that I was pretty darn lucky to have two parents and a stable family life. This guy was more concerned about having or helping his family, making sure that their well-being was taken care of, as well as with the homeless people in downtown Minneapolis where, where um, he was more concerned about getting them mittens and gloves because it was 30 degrees below zero than he was about himself. John Wahlberg was also another individual who touched me along in my Christian journey. The very next year, in just about the same place, there was this young-looking guy picking up his equipment. And the first thing I noticed was that his gym shorts were about three or four sizes too big. There's nothing worse, I, I guess, in my opinion, that, uh, that if you have uh, gym shorts that are too big, they just don't look right, and especially if you have skinny legs like John did. So he was going to be here today, and I thought I'd get him on that one. But uh, um, the one thing that John taught me was uh, a little bit more about community service, about stepping out of, your, out of your boundary, out of this area called Augsburg, and getting into the community. And uh, I later found out that John was nominated for the Pillsbury Corporations. It was the Pillsbury Corporation at the time for their Volunteer of the Year Award. Didn't surprise me, John was always a, a humble fellow. Don Warren, who cared about me as a person and as a student, G. Roy Carlson, a person who, was always, who has always made time for young people, always having the time to share his story and his Christianity. Jack Osberg, my former zoology teacher at Wyzetta, now head football coach here at Augsburg, um, uses his gifts and, and relayed his gifts to others about teaching and about coaching. There are many people who you will meet in your journey. When I graduated in 1985, I went into a career in sales. Many of you seniors here today um, 
have some of the same goals I did. I was tired of being broke. I wanted to get out and see what it was like in the real world. And as far as I was concerned, even if the job market was tough back then, uh, the future was mine. It was just a matter of finding out what I wanted to do and going out and doing it. During the four years I, was, I worked with Honeywell, I made good money relative to what others my age were making. I had a company car, all expenses paid for, and was able to buy some nice things. Sales were up and my stock was up, so to speak, but Honeywell didn't seem to notice, so I thought. So I left and I went into medical product sales. Here the money was very nice and I pretty much had it made, but within two months I had found out some things about this company's management style and some of the behaviors or behavior of, uh, of some of the sales reps and managers that I was with. While training with a senior sales rep down in Dallas who would later become a district manager, I learned that this senior rep, a guy I was looking up for guidance, advice, etc., had an affair with another married woman and he had, that he had picked up at the hotel we were staying at. Six months later, my boss, or my immediate boss, was fired for stealing money through his expense account. This was not what I was looking for as far as a, a stable environment. You will meet many types of people on your journey. I wasn't sure what I was looking for. All I knew that this company and this type of management was not for me. But what was I looking for? It's probably the hardest question um, young people especially will ask themselves, what am I going to do now that I, that I have a college degree and, and uh, I'm forced to go out into the real world? Um, what type of product did I want to sell? What type of service? I spent many hours talking to my wife Kim, who's also an Augsburg grad, and friends like John and Chuck, as well as returning to Augsburg many times to get the counsel from Giroy and Don Warren. Unlike my time in high school where I was a little unsure and even a bit embarrassed about my Christianity, I was looking for an environment where I could feel comfortable about talking about it, a place where I could put some roots 